This video is sponsored by Raycon. <sighs> Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Twilight Breaking Dawn, my marathon review of the Twilight Saga by Stephanie Meyer. Apologies in advance if the audio quality in this episode isn't up to my usual standard. Uh, you can't tell because of the green screen, but this is my first project in my new house, and I've not had a chance to fully soundproof the studio yet. Anyway, I think you know the drill by now, so let's just jump right into it. Part 1. What is Eclipse? Eclipse, the third book in the before-mentioned Twilight Saga, was published August 7th, 2007. Interestingly, this was the only Twilight book that Maya didn't write an accompanying essay with, volunteering information about her process, instead just answering questions about it when asked. According to said answers, the book was inspired by Weathering Heights by Emily Bronte, even though she didn't like that book, finding individual parts enjoyable but the story as a whole depressing, an opinion expressed by Edward in Eclipse. Part 2. What happens in Eclipse? As usual, let's start with the humorous clip notes. Edward wouldn't tell you this, but the person who was trying to kill you is still trying to kill you! <gasps> Bella, you will do what I say when I say it because I know what's best for you. Nope. Okay, yeah, that was probably fair. Okay, so werewolves can fall in love with, you know, in print on children. What? Oh, it, it's fine. We wait a few decades before we have sex with them. Okay, but that's... that's called grooming. No, no, it's not like that. You know, we'll just be a huge part in her life, you know, her mentor, her protector, and then take her on as a lover later when she's old enough and she's fallen in love with us too. That's literally what grooming is, Jacob. You're describing grooming. D d don't be judgy of other people's cultures, Bella. Edward, I would really, really like to have sex. <gasps> sex? Before marriage? But what about our virtue? Oh, you wanton hill! Oh. Well, I guess we're getting married then, because Mama needs her necrophilia! <laughs> A vengeance shall be mine. I'm going to drink your blood now! Vampire punch. <laughs> Hooray! I am so numb to violence at this point! And here's the less amusing but more helpful synopsis. The story starts with Bella grounded for her impromptu trip to Italy and her official time with Edward Limited. She's still determined to become a vampire soon, despite all of his attempts to get her to change her mind or at least delay it. She misses Jacob, but he refuses to see her while she's dating his species' mortal enemy. Everyone's a bit concerned because apparently there's a murder spree going on in the nearby city of Seattle, which Edward confirms is clearly vampire activity. Bella's father Charlie is obviously not aware that Wolfboy is the driving force behind their separation and has apparently become hardcore Team Jacob between books because he has come to truly detest Edward. Desperate to get her to date a lad he actually likes, he lifts her house arrest on the proviso that she try to see Jacob. However, when she tries to keep up her end of the bargain, Edward forbids it and blocks any attempt by force. Jacob eventually comes to her and reveals that Edward hasn't mentioned to her that Victoria has been making yet more attempts to get to her. Bella suggests that maybe she should be turned into a vampire early so she can protect herself from Victoria, but no one else agrees. Some of Bella's clothing goes missing in mysterious circumstances, but no one will agree that it's probably got something to do with Victoria because... Bella sneaks away to see Jacob a few times, and they argue about if Edward is any good for her and if she should be dating him instead. The Cullens figure out that someone is probably creating an army of vampires in Seattle, but assume it's rogue members of the Volturi and not Victoria because... Bella goes to a bonfire gathering of Native American werewolves and their elders, and hears the fabled magical origin story of their people. The Cullens decide it's time to develop strategies to fight this new army of vampires, and fortunately they have a military expert with them because Jasper was a major in the Confederate army. Jacob officially declares his love for Bella, but she rejects him. He is so angered by this, he forcefully kisses her, and Bella has to punch him, but only succeeds in breaking her hand on his tough werewolf jaw. Miss Swan eventually puts the insanely obvious two and two together and deduces that the army razor is Victoria and she had her clothes stolen to give her minions her target scent. Jacob says he's like totally sorry for the sexual assault and stuff and gives Bella a wolf charm bracelet. 
Bella forgives him. When he hears about the army coming to town, Jacob volunteers the werewolves to join the fight and even the odds. Bella wants to be involved in the battle and insists on at least being allowed to travel across the mountain path to leave a scent trail that would lead the attackers into an ambush. She's overcome with fear for Edward, so uses all of her powers of emotional manipulation to talk him into staying out of the battle with her on the sidelines. Edward doesn't want to abandon his family, but agrees for her sake. Bella and Edward travel up the mountain to set their trap and meet Jacob, who's there to cover their retreat with his pungent canine aroma. Jacob acts like a greasy drunk bro hitting on you at a Dave and Buster's. I have absolutely no idea what I just said, my co-producer Kate wrote that line. An unexpected snowstorm almost freezes Bella to death, but Jacob saves her by spooning her with his incredible werewolf body heat, which is nice, though apparently he thinks about doing incredibly dirty things to her the whole night, forcing Edward to see them with his vampire powers, which is a bit of a dick move. Edward and Jacob then talk about who would be the better option for her. Jacob admits he's never going to give up because he's convinced that Bella is in love with him as well, she just won't admit it. Edward claims that he would let Bella go if she ever chose Jacob over him, but admits that he would totes still stalk her from a distance for the rest of her life. He then tricks Jacob into overhearing Bella talking about them being engaged, and the lad is devastated. He tells Bella that he is going to go and die in battle to end the pain unless she begs him to kiss her again. Desperate to save his life, she does so, and then finds out that he was lying. Despite this, she's still concerned for his safety, so she asks Jacob to stay out of the battle as well, but he refuses to leave his pack to fight alone. While he and everyone else is duking it out, Victoria and an underling turn up to kill Bella, forcing Edward to fight Victoria with the help of the youngest werewolf, a lad called Seth, who was left behind to protect them. The good guys are victorious, and suspiciously, just a little too late to help the Volturi arrive. They thank the Cullens for cleaning up the mess that would have fallen to them to fix, and proceed to execute all of the surrendered newborn vampires. Bella learns that Jacob was wounded in the battle and goes to see him, finally telling him in no uncertain terms that she is never going to choose him, which bums her out, but hey, she's still excited about becoming a vampire soon, so... The epilogue is told from Jacob's perspective, as he is devastated to get a wedding invite from Edward, and runs off into the night. The end. Part 3. General Thoughts on Eclipse I have to admit, this is the first of the Twilight books that I just could not figure out regarding which bits were supposed to be the escapist fantasy. The idea of fearing for your life for an extended period of time while being sexually harassed and having to work through some serious issues with your partner just doesn't seem that appealing to me. And yet again, Maya's priorities remain perplexing to me. The entire book is written with the apparent expectation that we'll all be more interested in the love triangle than the battle between newborn vampires, vampire veterans, and werewolves. I get that these are primarily romance books and not action-adventure stories, but I mean... Why would you write this climactic fight into the story if you're going to treat it like it's an inconvenience getting in the way of the real plot? So, in printing... <sighs> okay, so a werewolf will occasionally see a girl who is perfect for him and be overwhelmed with an irreversible lifelong obsession and attraction to her, devoting all of his time from then on to protecting and loving her. The problem being, it can happen involving girls of any age, and Jacob ends up defending his friend to Bella for imprinting on a two-year-old by explaining that he's just planning to be a huge part in her life until she grows up and not get with her until she's old enough. I cannot even with this, choosing to write people of colour who, I remind you, are a real-life Native American tribe, normalising grooming as part of their way of life, it's just so tone-deaf! By which I mean, I wouldn't necessarily attribute this to overt racism, but the amount of thoughtlessness involved is Daggering! I got thrown off again by yet more inconsistencies in the vampire lore. Edward claims that his mentality is permanently stuck in the age and era of his death, so he'll always be a 17-year-old from the turn of the 20th century, which is why he has such immovable old-fashioned views on marriage. However, he is to say the least selective in what modern concepts he struggles with, and at one point he explains to Jacob that the reason that he seems so calm most of the time is because he's been perfecting his patience for 100 years 
others, so he clearly is capable of evolving, maturing, and changing as a person during his time as a vampire. If they are trapped in their original mindsets forever, I guess it's a good thing that Maya didn't write any black leads into her story who might have had to interact with Confederate Jasper. While unseen threat villains are not uncommon in fiction, their remaining unseen usually serves a recognisable purpose, either in building to a big reveal or because the effects of their actions are more impactful to the story than the person themselves. Victoria holds no mystique for the reader, as we all saw how unexceptional she was in the first book, and her goal has been common knowledge since the second. Never having her appear directly in the story until she turns up to be killed by Edward only really serves to diminish her in general. I thought that Jacob mentioning at the end of New Moon that Bella becoming a vampire would violate the treaty and result in war was setting up a conflict in this story that involves her being frustrated that this is a roadblock to her gaining immortality. But confusingly, she never acts like this is going to stop her. The only thing she ever acknowledges as a hindrance to her transformation is Edward's stubbornness. Even when Jacob reminds her about it and explains that there's no geographical limit to the agreement, she acts like if she just ignores it, it won't apply to her, or she just doesn't care that it will lead to death and destruction. I am going mad trying to think of one single reason why the final two-on-two -two tag team battle between the heroes and villains involves some kid called Seth and not Jacob. I can't be the only one who sees how much more satisfying it would have been from a narrative and character arc perspective, right? It would have shown that despite all their differences, when push came to shove, Edward and Jacob were willing to put their mutual hatred aside to save Bella. That would have added some tragic element to the fact that they go right back to hating each other right afterwards, and Jacob could have been injured in front of Bella, creating some emotional impact to that happening. But no, it's some kid werewolf we've basically never met before who chose to fight side by side with a vampire despite their species history, and Jacob is wounded saving the only female werewolf Leah. And of course there's no significance to him saving her, they hate each other, and this doesn't change that. It's just yet another occasion of a man protecting a woman. Speaking of Jacob, my boy. Look how she massacred my boy. My first instinct is to assume that Maya was taken aback by just how many people preferred the character that was genuinely nice over the arsehole that she told them to like and overcorrected, writing Jacob to be as terrible as she could to push people back to Team Edward. The only thing that complicates this theory is Maya's claim that she'd already written the first draft of Eclipse before the first book's publication and that she didn't change much in the rewrites, but asshole of fine Jacob could have been the exception, I suppose. That, or she's just telling porky pies. A lot of stuff has been coming up in the research for the conclusion video that suggests that Maya isn't always super honest about her process, but we'll come back to that. Either way, Jacob spends this entire book being a snide, mean-spirited ratbag who enjoys causing pain out of petty spite, and that is in his good moments. At one point, he expresses the opinion that he would prefer Bella be dead than a vampire. He does rescind this and apologise later, but the fact that he lashes out with something so horrible like that is not a good look. I thought perhaps an in-universe explanation for this change was being a werewolf made him a butt, but Maya was evidently not content to simply ruin Jacob going forward, she also retconned a bit and backdated his douchebaggery, revealing that Jacob was putting on the understanding best friend act in New Moon for the express purpose of of getting with Bella while she was still human. The non-consensual kiss, in addition to being the final nail in his personality coffin, was another one of those rare moments where Maya suddenly became a halfway decent author, but I kind of wish that she hadn't. She really imbued the description of him forcing himself on her with a disturbingly real feeling of violation and helplessness. I was physically uncomfortable experiencing through Bella what it was like to not have the strength to fight someone off, so having to go completely still while he does what he wants to her which made it utterly devastating to read the part where she forgives him a chapter or two later in exchange for a bracelet and a guilt trip self-pitying apology. I don't know if this is fair to say or not, but Maya seeming to have a solid understanding of what a horrific experience it is to be assaulted and the talent to convey it in her story makes it so much worse that she seems to believe that you should put it behind you if they say sorry about that and give you a halfway thoughtful gift. While not having one of your characters sexually assault another would have been my first choice in editing 
edits, the next best improvement would have been having Jacob earn his redemption by bringing the pack to save the Cullens at the end, and then, as mentioned earlier, him being the one to fight side by side with Edward. Bella can still break his heart later, so it ends the same way, but at least Jacob would have finished his story with some shred of likability. But no, instead it's jewelry and him just wanting a fight. He's not even doing it for Bella, the dude is just gagging for a good scrap with whatever vampires he can sink his teeth into. Moving on to our other male lead, Eclipse is very much a tale of two Edwards. Sparkle starts this book the worst I have ever seen him. He is horrifically controlling, manipulative and aggressive. He applies to universities on Bella's behalf without her consent, he lies to her to get her to travel when he wants her out of town, and he uses everyone he can to aid in his complete control over her, including her gullible dad. He does his best to restrict what information she has about her own situation at all times, and worst of all, he is so determined to keep her away from Jacob out of a combination of petty jealousy and genuine fear for her safety, he goes as far as to disable her truck to stop her from visiting him and paying his sister to hold her prisoner while he's out of town. When Bella comes back from defying him and visiting Jacob anyway, he's waiting for her on the border and follows follows her truck an inch behind in his car in a blatant display of intimidation. She's straight up scared of what his reaction to things will be. It's an abusive relationship through and through. Then, all at once, between chapters, he has a near perfect 180 degree turnaround and becomes a completely different person. Suddenly, he actually seems to be the person that everyone has been acting like he was for the first two books in total dissonance to his behaviour at the time. He becomes understanding and willing to compromise to a fault. He starts putting Bella's feelings first despite the hardship it causes him. He's fine with her spending as much time with Jacob as she wants because he trusts her judgement about what is safe for her and lets her make her own mistakes because he respects that she is her own woman with agency, even though he knows it will hurt him to see her suffer the consequences if she's wrong. He's unfailingly calm and never victim blames her for the things that Jacob forces on her or tricks her into doing, he admits when he was wrong and apologises, and when the chips are down he is willing to put his money where his mouth is when it comes to keeping himself safe for the sake of her mental health. Right at the end he even sees how messed up it was to coerce someone into marriage as part of a tit for tad and how cruel it was to use someone's deepest desires as bargaining chips in the first place, so he offers her everything, the sex, the vampirism, everything, and drops all of his provisos. I felt myself desperately wondering, who is this guy and what has he done to Edward? And then I realised, maybe that question isn't as figurative as you might think. You see, in chapter 11, a key part of the origin of the werewolf story involves a chief sending his soul into the spirit world to patrol in the form of a bird, only to have his human body invaded and stolen by an evil rival of his while he wasn't using it. In his commandeered body, the evildoer assumed the chief's entire life, fooling everyone around him and living for years in the lap of luxury, imposing his dark will on his tribe. I have gone back and forth over every page of this book and I cannot find one single purpose for the inclusion of this tangent and eclipse until I realise it's a tiny foreshadowing from the author who, as I have mentioned, is obviously hiding a surprising talent for disturbing horror writing regarding the secret dark fate of one of her main characters. I think it's pretty clear that on his hunting trip away from Forks, the vampire known as Edward somehow discovered a way to astro project, to leave his body and explore the spirit world, and while it was unoccupied and vulnerable, it too was stolen. Stolen by a being that was able to impersonate him in almost every way, but couldn't resist being a much, much nicer person because pretty much everyone is nicer than Edward. The original Edward is trapped in spirit form and his own personal hell, suffering for his wicked ways by spending eternity forced to watch his betrothed and his family rally around an imposter and come to love him in a way they never did him because of his cruelty and manipulations. And who could this mysterious body snatcher be you ask? Well. I don't know, this isn't a real theory, I've learnt my lesson about reading too much into these books. It's not that deep, bro. In all seriousness, I think this was yet another result of my reacting to the overwhelming positivity towards Jacob, the character she never really intended to be a credible romantic option. I guess it was a slight wake-up call that she needed to make the love interest that she was obsessed with actually likeable. That said, I now sincerely hope that Maya really does follow through on her threat to write the rest of the series from Edward's perspective, so we can see what the heck happened on this fateful hunting trip that changed him so bloody much. Not quite as done dirty as Wolfboy, but still pretty dirty did, is Bella's dad Charlie 
a fairly innocuous character in the first book, he earned some respect for me in the second by being the only person willing to take Bella's concerns for Jacob seriously. However, his clear preference for Jacob takes him way into the field of total arsehole of an eclipse. It gets so bad when Bella reveals that she broke her hand defending herself from Jacob's assault, Charlie congratulates the little shit for taking his shot, laughing at his daughter's injury and joking with Jacob about pressing charges against her. Once again, Maya seems oblivious to how absolutely horrific she's made a character because not long afterwards, Bella assures him that he's a good parent, calling him the world's best dad. He does eventually come around enough to tell Bella that she was right to punch any man who kisses her without consent, but immediately starts pressuring her to forgive Jacob. World's best dad, everyone. And now, a word about our sponsor. As you well know, my beautiful watchers, I am a great lover of audiobooks and nothing improves a listening experience more than a darn good set of headphones. And right now you can get a lovely 15% off a purchase of your own pair by going to buyraycon.com forward slash Dominic Noble. Raycon is built around the mission that everyone deserves to enjoy great audio. As such, Raycon earbuds combine high quality sound, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and a comfortable design with remarkably good noise isolation due to their adjustable fit. The earbuds themselves hold six hours of battery life and they can be recharged on the go from the handy compact charging case bringing their usability to a full 24 hours. Raycon also has a 45 day free returns policy so you can be sure they're the right earbuds for you. The everyday E25 earbuds provide the same advantages of high end expensive earbuds for a way more reasonable price and as I mentioned you can get an additional 15% off your purchase by following the link in the video description or going to buyraycon.com slash Dominic Noble. Part 4. Some positive stuff about Eclipse. You may have noticed I've not discussed Bella in any significant way until now. Well, that's because, believe it or not, I consider her one of the positive aspects of this book. Mostly. Because, for questionable reasons I can't quite remember now, I made the decision to read Twilight's knockoff Fifty Shades of Grey first, I had high expectations that Bella would be more akin to Anna Steele, i.e. a complete doormat of a person. But no, Bella Swan takes no shit from her sparkly boyfriend. When he forbids her from doing something, she ignores him. When he tries to stop her by force, she circumvents it. When he confronts her, she confronts him right back. There's definitely some sort of maiden in distress fetish at play in the Twilight books, but this at least was a pretty badass maiden. She even, without hesitation, makes serious plans to sacrifice herself in the hopes that it would spare the rest of the town from the coming slaughter. In other news, Maya can write a pretty solid fight scene, which frustrates me slightly considering how often she goes out of her way to avoid doing so. At one point in this, Edward rips the arm off a vampire he's fighting and throws it to hit Victoria mid-leap as she's trying to pounce on Bella. It was a pretty boss move. I'm also amused that when Bella does something dramatic and stupidly self-sacrificing to help right at the end, even though he's in the middle of a fight, you can hear Edward sigh in exasperation. Part 5. Quickfire thoughts about Eclipse. Bella doesn't bat an eyelash when she finds out about Confederate Jasper. I feel like maybe at least a yikes would have been appropriate. The story about how a heartbroken Sam scarred Emily's face in an act of uncontrollable passion rings of normalizing domestic violence, and like many other things in this, I don't think it was intentional, but all of these accidental horrors are starting to exhaust me. Maya doesn't change her writing cadence when it's someone telling a story within the story, so it seems like everyone briefly becomes Bella when they explain their past. Wow, Anna's mum not coming to her graduation in Fifty Shades is just Twilight. Like, both times it was because their new husband broke a leg. James kind of just forgot to file off the serial numbers on that one, and it serves no purpose in that story. I really should have done Twilight first, I don't know what I was thinking. It was treated as a very defining moment when Edward agreed to stay out of the fight for Bella, but Jacob didn't, as if the clear choice was to place the happiness of one significant other over the safety of one's family. I would think there was merit to both choices here, love versus duty and all that, but I guess that was more nuanced than I should have expected from these books. I think I'm going to have to save the both sides are as bad as each other when it comes to werewolf vampire racism discussion for later. I need more time to unpack this, but once again, yikes a -rooney. Physical age seems very significant in these books. Bella freaks out at the idea of her not being a teen for eternity while Edward is, and Jacob points out that he's not younger than Bella anymore because apparently once they've changed for the first time, werewolves age to 25 years old in months and then stay there indefinitely. I think Maya's trying to say that age is purely biological and not experience-based at all. I mean, 
it's one way of looking at it, I guess. I think everyone's backstories have been explored now, making every member of the Cullen family officially more interesting than the leads, but we'll come back to that later too. <sighs> you know, I I'm seeing the same obsession with babies start to creep in here as I did in the Enders Games books. I I'm not looking forward to the final installment in this series. So, all in all, I have to disagree with those of you who commented that Eclipse was even more boring than New Moon. I was too consistently enraged by the utter character assassination of one Jacob Black to be bored, and it had a halfway decent scrap to end on for once. Just before we part ways, my beautiful watchers, I would like to take a second to draw your attention to a potential video to watch after this one. My co-producer Kate, who's been helping me get through these books, has put out a video about the Shira reboot, so if that's something that interests you, do check it out. Otherwise, don't forget to do all those things that stop YouTube channels from crashing and burning and like liking, sharing, subscribing, and leaving groovy comments. Stick around to the end for bloopers and whatnot. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I will see you soon. No shirt, no shoes, no need for clothes flexing. So much testosterone kissing. Your girl, she booped my nose just like an animal. You're a pale guy, emotions just too frail guy. Crying, weeping, whale guy. Incel beta male guy. I'm the Chad type, always underclad type Make your girlfriend mad type, then I five her dad type I'm the bad wolf Woof Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor Shelby Holtz, Sam Cucinotta, and Atel Spurdloff And special thanks to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson Be sure to check out her channel for more of that sweet, sweet YouTube content <laughs> Choke myself Oh, that was unpleasant. If you're going to treat it like it's an inconvenience, getting a little, little, little bit too stuffy, they're like Hugh Grant. Holding for the, it's not that deep, bro. I'm not just having a stroke. Total dissonance to his real, oh, so Terry, now is not the time for the scratching post. Total eclipse of the heart.